Okay, well, let's see. We're going to start another class, and we're finally up to seminar part three after, what, uh, 14 weeks of getting through the first, uh, first two parts. We're going to talk about dinosaurs and how they fit into the Bible. The reason I put so much emphasis on dinosaurs, I guess, in my ministry is because Christians are really confused by the topic, and I was confused by the topic as a, as a new Christian, and so many millions of kids are being brought into believing in evolution via the dinosaurs. That's what Satan is using, and so we've got to counteract this uh, doctrine that's being taught. The Bible says in Genesis 1-1, God created, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, this National Geographic issue says, no human being has ever seen a live dinosaur. Now, when I deal with kids, I will say, now, hold it, kids. Does the guy that wrote this book, does he know that, or does he think that? Let's say, well, he thinks that. There's no way he can know that. In order for him to know that is true, he would have to know every human being alive, wouldn't he? I'm sure he doesn't. He would have to know everybody that, everybody, that ever lived. And I know he doesn't do that. So there's no way he can know that. He can only think that is true, and it's not true at all. The Bible says in Exodus chapter 20, In six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. So if everything was made in six days, <clears throat> Adam must have seen dinosaurs. They had to be created with Adam <clears throat> somewhere during that first week. The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 6, God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And we covered this earlier, how that this firmament is probably a layer of water, uh, or the atmosphere, and a layer of water above this atmosphere. Uh, and there was also water under the crust of the earth. We'll get into a lot more of this on video uh, seminar part 6 when we get up to there in about 40 years, of uh, how the original creation was so different and how this water that was under the crust of the earth came shooting up to the surface. And that's where most of the flood water came from. The Bible tells us in uh, Psalm 136 and in Psalm 24 that the earth was made on top of the water. <clears throat> so there was a lot more water under the crust of the earth when God first made it. We'll get into that later. Anyway, before the flood came, from the creation until the flood, uh, the world was a lot different. People lived to be, you know, 900 years old, and things changed after the flood. But during this pre-flood era, we call it the Garden of Eden, but actually they were kicked out of the garden probably after 100 years, and the rest of the 1,500 years is still a beautiful world, but thorns and thistles, and nothing like it was for the first 100 years, but still, you know, living 900 years old, so things were a lot different. I'm not sure exactly what the curse did to the world, and I don't know how, how much effect that had on things that Adam saw, but and there is not much preaching been done because there's not much scripture on the curse. We know what the flood did. I mean, that really wrecked it. But the curse apparently, certainly at least made the plants grow thorns and thistles. It might have been a recessive gene that became active. It might have been God just took his hand off and allowed certain things to happen. It's like if you don't ever work on your car, it's eventually going to break. And God said, that's it. I'm letting this place go to pot now. Whereas before, I don't know. I'm just giving some options. He was, may have been sustaining it before. But before the flood, they're living 900 years. After the flood, it dropped off to 400, then 200, and then 100, and today not many make it to 100. So it's a lot different back then. Now, reptiles during this time grew to be huge. See, reptiles never stop growing. At the end of your bones, there are certain kinds of cells that continually grow until you reach a certain age, and then they stop. That's why if you break your arm or your leg, if you break a bone when you're a child, and you break it right across the, near the joint, there's a good chance you may have an arm shorter than the other or a leg shorter than the other because you mess up those cells that are that's where the growth takes place, and it's only at the end of the bone. Reptiles don't have that. They grow all their life. They never stop. Uh, people stop growing, at least vertically, uh, when they're 16 or 18. I've seen them grow horizontally after that for a long time. But reptiles simply never stop growing. Eric, remember when we went to the uh, alligator gardens, or what was that called, alligator farm in uh, Orlando? We asked the guy, you know, how big do these alligators get? He said, well, we raise them under close to ideal conditions here. All of the ones in the pond are the same size, so there's no competition. There, aren't, there isn't a big one to eat the little ones. You know, in this pond, it's all one-year-olds. In this pond, it's all two-year-olds. And he said, uh, we give them all the food they can, they can handle so they don't have to fight for it. And we get them from egg to, in one year, to five feet long. After two years, they're seven feet long. After three years, they're about eight feet long or something. They never stop growing, but the growth rate declines. 
Assuming this to be true before the flood, there's no reason it wouldn't be, the reptiles would grow to be huge. Dinosaurs were just big lizards in the Garden of Eden. So the obvious question comes up, you think Noah took dinosaurs on the ark? Well, sure. People say, dinosaurs on the ark, they're kind of big, aren't they? Ferocious meat-eating T-Rex? Well, he wasn't a meat-eater until after the flood. Yeah, bring babies. I mean, Noah was 600 years old when he built the boat. He probably was smart enough by then to figure out you don't have to bring the biggest ones. <laughs> bring two babies. Just be sure to get a pink one and a blue one. Uh, that'll be important later. There's a lot of reasons why you ought to bring babies, okay? Number one, they're smaller, obviously. They weigh less. Number two or three, they eat less. Number four, they sleep a lot more. And uh, they're tougher. Kids fall down and bounce and get up and keep running. Adults fall down and break or lay there for a while. And plus, uh, they'll live longer after the flood to produce more offspring. And that's why you're bringing them to begin with. Why on earth would you bring an old one? You know, bring young ones and let them live longer after the flood. Um, it just makes sense. One of the debates I did, I don't know, if, Eric, if you saw that one, uh, debate number seven with the former preacher turned atheist. He said, how's Noah going to keep all those giraffes on that ark, you know, because they got that, you got to have a special sling to carry a giraffe because their neck will get hurt, you know, because they're, they're so tall. Well, he's assuming a full-grown giraffe. Baby giraffe, six feet tall, it's not a problem. They don't need the special sling for transportation. They're closer to the ground, they're tougher. Um, and they always look for stuff like that, you know. Th th first, they pick an absurd example like one of the, how did he fit those billions of species of beetles on the ark? The question is always flawed, and you have to learn to watch for that. This scoffer said, how did he get, you know, he says he took seven of the clean, and the giraffe chews the cud and has a split hoof, so he'd have to take, you know, 14 giraffes, 14, you know, 15, 14, 15 foot tall giraffes on the ark. Ha, ha, ha. You believe that happened? I try to point out to him, first place, he took babies, okay. Secondly, what you believe is so much dumber. You believe a giraffe evolved from a rock <laughs> over 4.6 billion years ago. I don't understand how they can strain at the gnat and swallow such a camel. It's funny. It's, it's hard not to laugh at them, so I go ahead and laugh at them because <laughs> it, it, it really is dumb. But, uh, you know, our obj Satan has them blinded, that's all. We should try to win them to the Lord, you know. They're just blinded by the devil into believing that dumb theory. So, Noah took two of everything. God told him, all you got to do is read the Bible carefully, and it tells us the solution. God said, I want you to bring two of every sort, not two of every species. What happened in the mid-1800s, uh, they started arguing about, you know, the, a doctrine was taught, and many teachers taught this, called the fixidity of the species. So if there's a certain animal, like a... Um, a dog like the Alaskan Husky that really is comfortable and survives in cold weather and would be miserable down in hot weather, probably wouldn't survive. I mean, if, if, he, if somebody was chasing him, he's got all that hair on him, he would overheat quickly. Whereas, uh, you know, a short-haired dog like a dingo is very comfortable in hot weather like Australia. If you put him up in Alaska, he's going to freeze, okay? So, some people are going around teaching, well, this proves God made the dingoes in Australia for Australia, and he made the huskies in Alaska for Alaska. There's no change in the species. So Doc, uh, Darwin came around and rebelled against that teaching, and he was right to do that. I mean, that was dumb, what they were teaching. The people were teaching the fixity of the species. Species never change. Well, the question is, what is a species? The Bible doesn't use the word species. The Bible says, I want you to bring them after their sort, the same sort of animal. If you read Genesis 7, a bunch of times in this chapter, it says, bring the beast after his kind, after their kind, after his kind, after his kind. I mean, I think God wanted us to get the message. It's the basic kinds, not the species. So the argument is not species, it's kinds. And if you're going to get into a discussion or a debate or an argument on creation or evolution, I would encourage you to stay away from the word species. Because nobody's ever gotten a good definition for it. They'll say, well, animals that normally breed together are same species. Okay, well, a dog and a wolf are different species. Canis lupus and Canis domesticus. But they can still breed and have puppies. So what's your definition of species again? There isn't a good definition. Now, the biblical kind, if you go back and read Genesis, God says they're going to bring forth after their kind. So the way you tell what a kind is, is were they originally able to bring forth offspring 
that could also bring forth offspring. Bring forth uh, not sterile offspring. A horse and a mule today, a horse and a jackass can, can crossbreed and make a mule, which is almost always a male, and all the males are sterile, I believe. About one in 20,000 is born that is, that is not sterile. But then either those kids are sterile or they become back to a horse or, or a jackass. So there's a good possibility that the horse and the jackass had a common ancestor. I wouldn't argue about that. But stand back and look at them. You're talking about the same kind of animal. You know, This doesn't prove the horse and the banana have a common ancestor. That's for sure. So, And the God, God told him to bring all those in whose nostrils was the breath of life and those on dry land. Now here's what will happen. Some skeptic or scoffer will, will f figure out how many species of animals there are in the world. He won't figure the kinds, he figures the species. And then he figures including all the fish, and including all the insects, and he says there are X number of million species in the world. Well, this number is derived because modern day scientists have decided that certain animals are different species. But if you stand back and look at them, they're the same kind of animal. I mean, we've got dog, wolf, coyote. There's three simple examples that are the same kind of animal and probably had a common ancestor, but they're three different species. So they will set up a straw man by claiming there are millions of species in the world, and there are. Mil way too many species to go on the ark. Way too many. And they'll say, are there too many species to fit on the ark? I say, I agree. But you think it happened? You think what happened? You think he put all those species on the ark? Oh, no, no. I think he put all the kinds on the ark. He brought them after their sort, only those in whose nostrils was the breath of life, and only those on dry land take out the fish. Take out the insects. They don't breathe through nostrils. Insects absorb oxygen through their skin. Which spiracles? spiracles, right. It's called a spiracle. It's a hole in the skin where they pull oxygen in, and that's how they get it. And we get into the surface area to volume ratio problem. Did we do that in one of the classes here? Yeah. As a... As an insect gets larger, it ends up effectively having less skin per cubic inch of meat, and so it can't get enough oxygen to breathe. So, so why do we have insects now? Well, we have insects that aren't as big. We still have them. They're just not as big. Were they on the ark? Oh, yeah. Now, some insects might have been on the ark, but they didn't have to be. Insects can survive a flood just fine. They would, many insects can burrow in the mud. Uh, some spiders can take an air bubble down with them and build their nest underwater, you know. Um, it doesn't take much air to keep an insect happy for a long time. Plus, I suspect during the flood you would get turbulent uh, uh, areas where you would have, you know, stuff trapped. The, the big thing, I, I think most of the insects survived on floating dead material, log mats. Let's suppose you have a flood. Go, go any place where there's a flood going on and just watch out like in a river, raging river. There's all kinds of stuff floating down the river. How long would a person last on a log floating around? Yeah, a week, maybe, if he's lucky, right? Sure. He's going to fall asleep, you know, so sooner or later. <laughs> now, how long would an insect last on a floating log mat? Yeah. Build a new colony. All right? Start a family. <laughs> I mean, so insects survive floods. Today we have all these varieties of dogs, and they probably came from a common ancestor. It was a dog. And Noah probably never saw a chihuahua. Most of the dogs we have today are through selective breeding because some guy decided, well, you know, I'd like to have a little bitty dog to keep in my lap. Not like yours, Jan. Your, your dog still gets in your lap, that big old Saint Bernard, uh, German Shepherd, not anymore? Yeah, what is she, 100 pounds now? Or? No, she's only 75. Only 75, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Still, some people, like the Chinese, they, they, it's a real big deal with them to raise particular dogs for particular purposes, you know. Some dog is born with some slight deformity or something, and they'll say, you know, I really like that. Let's, uh, let's... Let's crossbreed that and develop this trait, and you end up with a pug, you know, the nose caved in. Looks like it's been chasing parked cars all of its life or something. And there are 250 varieties of dogs, some say 400, you know, varieties of dogs in the world today. Noah probably never saw a chihuahua. Most of the dogs we have have been crossbred or specially bred for some particular purpose, like the dachshund. Half a dog high, dog and a half long. Those were special bred to go chase something down a hole, a weasel, I think, you know, because somebody wanted to hunt weasels or whatever it was, you know. So they kept finding dogs with shorter and shorter legs, and they'd, pretty soon you got a whole species of those things. Or not a species, you got a whole, a whole variety of dog. Now, like our dog, Nicky, over there, he's a canardly. 
I tell folks you can hardly tell what kind he is, so he's a canardly. But uh, the generic dogs is what they probably had on the ark. It's a very good possibility that the horse and the zebra have a common ancestor in the burrow. Stand 30 feet away and look at them, folks. You're talking about the same kind of animal. This doesn't prove a horse and a banana have a common ancestor. And I always use an ex absurd example like that to try to shock them into reality. Think, wow, you're right. I, what I believe is dumb. And could you be accused of setting up a straw man like that? Or that no, that's really a fact. That is what they teach. Yeah. I'm, I'm not... Like saying, you know, you believe this came from a rock. Uh, some people are just setting up a straw man. So I get them all the time get mad at me for saying that. And I say, okay, it, in what I, is what I'm saying correct? Do you believe we came from a rock? And they'll say, not directly, no. Okay, well, <laughs> indirectly, yeah, do you believe it? I'll give you all the billions of years you want. Time is not, I'll give you 50 zillion years. Do you think we came from a rock? And they have to say yes. But they don't want to say yes because then they might realize how dumb this is. But willingly ignorant is the best way I can describe it. Okay, skeptics will say, how did Noah fit those millions of animals on the ark? I always say, well, how many animals are there? Yeah. Yeah. How many were there? I don't know. There's about 8,000 different kinds of animals, according to uh, the Creation Action Hilo magazine back in 97. And I don't know how many kinds there are. I don't know how many original created kinds there were. I don't think anybody here does either. But 8,000 is a reasonable number. So uh, he only had to bring land animals. I only bring those with nostrils. That wipes out all the bugs, all the insects. I'll bring babies. Of course, that's just common sense. Bring two of each kind, not two of each variety. So, and then the skeptics, when they say, you know, I couldn't put all those animals on the ark, the two questions I ask them, how many were there? How many animals were there? They say they don't know. And I say, how big was the ark? They say, we don't know. All we know is he couldn't do it. Oh, I see. <laughs> That's real objective science, you know. Uh, they don't even know what they're talking about. They just really don't like the idea of a Bible that is accurate because, you know, that might mean they're in trouble someday. It really is a either conscious or subconscious desperate attempt to eliminate God's authority in their life. That's why the scoffers are willingly ignorant of the creation and the flood. They just don't like the idea that God has the authority to judge sin. Well, I'm sorry. He does, and he's going to do it again. <laughs> and you better get ready for it. So... The skeptics believe, of course, 20 billion years ago there was a big bang, and 4.6 billion years ago the earth cooled down, and then it de developed a hard rocky crust as it cooled down, and it rained on the rocks for millions of years. This is what the textbooks teach. Millions of years of torrential rains created the oceans. And swirling in the waters of the oceans is a bubbling broth of complex chemicals. Progress from a complex chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Well, I guess it is. So slow it stopped, doesn't even happen. Nobody's ever seen it happen. Now, for years, people have done experiments and proven that non-living material does not come to life. That is called spontaneous generation. That'll be a good quiz question, Becky. Spontaneous generation is the belief that non-living material can come to life. 200 years ago, there were formulas in books, how to create mice. Put a bunch of old rotten rags and wheat in a corner of a building and leave it for three weeks. And it will turn into mice. Well, duh. <laughs> okay. Let's say take a piece of rotten meat, set it outside. For four days, it'll create flies. Flies are created by rotting meat. That's what they taught. Well, of course, Francisco Reddy and Louis Pasteur came along and did their experiments and proved, hey, folks, it doesn't happen. It, it doesn't happen, okay? Non-living material does not come alive. But here's a textbook in 1994 teaching the kids progress from a chemical soup to a living organism is very slow. Now, this is sheer baloney. Now, he's welcome to believe that. I don't care what this author believes. But that's not science. That doesn't belong in a science book, that's for sure. Here's a college textbook. Look what it says. The first self-replicating, in other words, able to reproduce... The first self-replicating systems must have emerged in this organic soup. Now, you have to watch. In evolutionist literature, they use that word emerged all the time. You know, 
Man emerged from the apes. Life emerged from the soup. What does that mean? I mean, explain that to me, would you please? So what happens is they're able to psychologically hide behind that word emerged. Well, it must have happened, you know. We emerged. <laughs> it's meaningless. doesn't mean a thing. There, it's, not, it's not empirical. There's no scientific data to back this up. Nobody's ever seen non-living material come alive. Nobody's ever seen soup come alive. It just doesn't happen. Uh, so they believe, you know, 20 billion years ago, Big Bang. And I will try, I try to be sweet about it, but it's, it's so fun to be sarcastic, I guess, uh, that I have a blast. You having the same problem, Eric? It's just fun. It's tough to be sweet, but you try, you know. Uh, I like to make fun of what, I guess I have the Elijah personality in me, you know. What's the matter? Is your God sleeping? Cry a little louder, huh? <laughs> you know, so. We need some people in the creation movement that are sweet and gentle and, you know, work with these folks. And bless God, I thank, I'm thank, thankful there's people like that. But it's not me. I'm not one of them, okay? You know, you need the Air Force, but you also need the Marines to get in there and blow stuff up, you know? <laughs> right, yeah, right, yeah. Um, and then you need people to go in and fix things, you know? And, you know, you need the politicians to go in there and mess it up again so we can have another war 20 years later and let the bankers get rich again. Uh, right. So I will show them, I have learned in debates or in talking to people, one of the most effective things you can do is to show them what they believe instead of just tell them what they believe. Because somehow when you say, four billion years ago, the brain shuts off. You can't comprehend four billion years, and so you just think, wow, it must have happened. But when you put it on a timeline and say, okay, look what you guys believe. Twenty billion years ago, Big Bang, what exploded? Where did it come from? 4.6 billion years ago, the Earth cooled down. Has anybody ever seen a planet form? No. No. Is there any evidence you can get a bunch of fragments together and it'll form a perfectly round ball? How did all this stuff melt and get together? The Earth doesn't have enough heat to do that. Is it all bombarded? I mean, you can go on and on on this problem right here. Nobody's ever seen this happen. Then, how did, the, how did life start? Nobody's ever seen that happen. But they believe it did, so I will tell them, you know, that, that what they think is silly. And they'll say, well, you think all the dogs came from two dogs on Noah's Ark? I say, well, yeah. Do you think all the dogs came from a rock? <laughs> and it shocks them. Wow, wait a minute. That is crazy, isn't it? Here's the evolutionist life first, you know. Saying to a stock, thou art my father, and to a stone thou hast brought me forth. Uh, in my dad's life verse, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is lunatic and sore vexed. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So, here we have... A flood in the days of Noah. Where is the evidence for this? The Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, the earth was corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said to Noah, everybody's corrupt. The earth's full of violence. I'm going to destroy the world. Build an ark. So God's, Noah said to the boys, hey, go for wood. We're going to build us a boat. And so they went for wood. Well, go for wood. People have argued what go for wood is. Some people think it's white oak. I don't know. Other people think that word means laminated. Make the ark out of laminated wood. Uh, if you cross grain wood, you know, you turn it cross grain to itself, it becomes much stronger. You know, the guys who do karate will tell you, if you're going to break a board, if you break it with the grain, it's not hard. Get two boards to cross grain to each other and break it. You know, break a, piece, break a half inch piece of plywood. Or, remember when <laughs> Robbie, we told him to rip, rip that plywood for us. He was working for us. Poor guy, he didn't know what we meant. You know, it's just a term used in construction. We ripped this plywood, a sheet of plywood. We came back, and he had, he, a huge, strong guy, he had actually ripped about that far down the sheet of plywood. I said, what have you done? He said, you told me to rip the plywood. I don't see how you guys do this so straight. <laughs> it was so funny. Uh, oh, Robbie, we use a saw, you know. <laughs> uh, some people think gopher wood means laminated. I don't know. Okay, we'll find out when we get to heaven. But after the flood was over... Noah's son, Shem, had a boy and named him Arphaxad. Now, who on earth would name a kid Arphaxad? I don't know, but Shem did. Now, don't you think, Arphaxad, one day, he got big enough. He started to become aware of the world around him. It's neat when that happens to kids. All of a sudden, it's like, thumb. <laughs> They'll look at it for hours. Where did that thing come from? <laughs> Has that been there all along? Or foot, wow. Anyway. I'm sure one day our fax had got big enough. He's sitting on Grandpa Noah's lap, and he looks around. He says, hey, Grandpa Noah, how come we're the only people in the whole world? 
eventually that thought's going to cross his mind, don't you think? Where is everybody? And Grandpa Noah is going to tell him the story about the flood. I am convinced that Adam and Eve were able to tell the story of the creation to many generations. I wouldn't split a church over it like some people would, but I don't think Adam and Eve had a belly button. That would be a great object lesson for the great, 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 great grandkids. Hey, kid, come here, look at this. Wow, Grandpa, how come you don't have a belly button? <laughs> well, let me tell you a story, son, you know. It was, it's just an object lesson, I suspect they didn't, there's no reason for them to have one. Uh, by the way, it's the fad in California now. If they go to people who do ear piercing and body piercing and all this. They have some kind of surgery, they eliminate your belly button. It's gone. They say you can't tell it was ever there. I think the trees would have had rings because uh, trees give the laminate effect. If, trees had, if God created trees with rings, ex nihilo, yeah. they would have had rings. So Adam probably had a navel. Uh, that's why the church in California split over that question did Adam and Eve have a belly button? And the one church, they went across town and started a new church, of course, called the Church of the Navalites. I, like I said, I wouldn't split a church over it. I, don't, I wouldn't preach it as doctrine, but I think it's uh, interesting. Anyway, Noah then is going to tell the story to our fact set about the flood, or Shem would. Actually, Noah and Shem lived long enough to tell the story to a whole bunch of their grandkids. Now, Shem lived long enough to know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is a question of whether he knew Jacob or not. And Eric, you might be aware of the controversy here. How old was Terah when Abram was born? He was either 70 or 130. We might have to shift the last three, Isaac, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, shift them over 60 years because of other references in Scripture. Okay, if you read in a timeline, on my timeline that I have, my chart, there are some reference notes here about this. And uh, Henry Morris has a good note about this, this discrepancy of 60 years uh, in one of his books, which is referred to in here. <clears throat> Doesn't matter. Certainly Noah, either way, uh, Shem lived long enough to know Abraham and Isaac and possibly Jacob. Okay, depending if you shift the chart over to 60 years or not. But just some, somebody will get a hold of you someday and say, oh, that's not accurate because, you know, uh, they'll give you some other reference of how old somebody was. And by the time you chase down all the genealogies, it still is a little confusing, but it, it possibly should be shifted over 60 years. I don't know. It's not a big deal. Anyway, the story of the flood is going to be passed down generation after generation, and it, they can all go back and verify it with Noah. I mean, he's still alive. So today, 4,400 years later, there are still 270 surviving flood stories that have been found. That'll be a quiz question. How many flood legends have been found? Those are 270. 270 existing flood legends from cultures all over the world. And when you read them, it's amazing to see the similarity between the biblical account and these flood legends 4,400 years later. For instance, the Hawaiian legend says, Long after the death of Kunihana, the first man, the world became a wicked, terrible place to live. There was one good man left. His name was Nu'u. He made a great canoe with a house on it, filled it with animals. The waters come up over all the earth and killed all the people. Only Nu'u and his family were saved. Now, here we have a legend that is very similar to the Bible. You have one family saved in a great canoe full of animals, from a flood. Um, the Chinese, the oldest known story, I believe, in China is called the High King Classic, which tells about a guy named Fu Hai that they say is the father of their civilization. The story goes that Fu Hai, his wife, three sons, and three daughters escaped a great flood. After the flood, they were the only people left on earth, and they repopulated the world. So here you have a story with one man, three sons, and three daughters, and his wife, eight people, saved on a boat from a flood. I don't know that the Fuhai story mentions the animals, but it still, it, it would tie in. The Tolik Indians in Mexico, their oldest... Hmm? Do we have a book that sells these? This is in the book, Dinosaurs by Design, the red hardback book, uh, okay. right there, by Dwayne Gish. This, these are where I got these pictures from. Um, the Tolik Indians in Mexico, now he only has a few of the stories, okay? Um, who... A guy called me a few weeks ago that is collecting as many stories as can be found. He's going to publish a book with all just the stories in it. Wow. Somebody keeps sending me every couple months, they send me, because they're doing research, they're spending their lifetime researching Tower of Babel stories. 
Indian cultures that will say, oh yeah, there was a time when everybody spoke one language, but now we all speak different languages because, you know, they, and sometimes the stories get kind of wild, you know, because somebody, you know, cut off a snake's head and the snake, you know, bit him on the foot and said, now you're going to speak a new language, you know. The stories get kind of wild, the mythology, but they, the idea is universal that everybody did speak one language at one time. Forked tongue, I guess they would. Uh, the Tolik Indian legend says, <clears throat> the first world lasted 1,716 years and was destroyed by a great flood. Only one family named Cox Cox survived. Well, 1,716 years is interesting because the Bible says it was 1656 if you add up the dates in the Bible. Now, I don't know if there are gaps in the genealogies, and that could go, that discussion would go for hours and hours. You know, there are some problems between the chronologies and the genealogies. There's a few extra people mentioned in there. And if you read uh, Henry Morris's Defender's Bible, he's got great explanation for that. Sometimes it says, you know, Abraham was the father of David. Well, obviously he's not the father of David. He's the great, 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 great grandfather of David. But it's just a Hebrew, uh, what do they call it, idiom, or is there another name for it? Colloquialism? Yeah. It's just a way of expression of saying, you know, he's the father. So there may be a few gaps in our genealogies. I don't think uh, it's not serious, and there are some other places that close up an awful lot of the gaps, where it says, for instance, Enoch, the seventh from Adam, says that in the book of Jude. Well, if Enoch is the seventh from Adam, then that closes up many gaps there, right? Um, the Bible dates, though, of 1656 may or may not be exactly correct. And that's why, in, in here my seminars, I always say about 6,000 years ago and about 4,400 years ago. Technically, this should be 4,356. Uh, 4,344, whatever it is. Uh, but it, it, I just round it off, okay, because I don't think you can get the exact dates. The legend, though, of the Tolik Indians is only 60 years different from the Bible story. So here you have people in Mexico maintaining a legend for thousands of years, people in Israel maintaining their Bible for thousands of years, and when we finally put them both together, 4,000 years later, it's only 60 years off. Not bad. Um, the Babylonians have a legend about this. Uh, uh, lots and lots of stories. There's a great book by Bill Cooper called After the Flood. I don't know if you've seen that one yet, Eric. I got it in my office. We almost decided to carry that book, as you know, and I still may someday, because it's really good. He traces the genealogies of at Noah's three sons. Where did they go? He goes back and who was the first king of uh, France, the first king of or leader of England? And he's really done incredible work with genealogies. Now, the, uh, Bill Cooper is very, very sick, I understand, possibly dying uh, over in England is where he lives with cancer or something. But um, the, the book is tremendous called After the Flood. If you want to get more detail on that, you can get it, I know, from ICR. If you call our ministry, if you get this tape and want one, we can order you one. We'll get one for you. Um, but Mount Ararat is located in the corner of where Turkey and Russia and Iran come together. Now, it's a pretty good distance from Iraq as opposed to Iran, which used to be called Persia. But uh, on a Turkish map, this area is called Noah on Gomshi, Noah's big boat. I had a fellow in a seminar one time was really angry at me. He said, it doesn't say big boat. It just says Noah's boat. So, okay. Sorry. <laughs> this is from Ron Wyatt's book, uh, Noah's Big, <coughs> Big Boat. Ron's been there many, many times to that region. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 8, the ark rested in the seventh month upon the mountains of Ararat. Now, it's interesting. It rested the seventh month, but he didn't get out till the 13th month. Why would you stay in there for six more months? Several reasons. Number one, there's nothing to eat outside. I mean, go someplace where they just had a flood, go out and stand in the middle of the flood plain, the mud, there's nothing there. No McDonald's. No McDonald's. <laughs> nothing. All the animals would die if you let them out. There's nothing to eat out there. How long would it take, how long does it take if you plant a garden, how long until you can eat the, the fruit of your garden? Three or four months, right? He stayed in six more months. Plenty of time for seeds that were floating around to begin to grow again. There'd be food out there. Trees probably wouldn't be very tall. I mean, I, I think when Noah got off the ark, there was nothing over a few feet tall. Some plants, you know, bamboo grows real fast. Maybe in some stuff 10 feet tall or 15 feet. But basically, it, it was a ruined world. And a lot of people think that after the flood, Noah's sons, at least one of them, 
became bitter over that beautiful world was destroyed. Why would God do that? The people before the flood weren't that bad, were they? And we tend to look at sin from our perspective instead of God's perspective. God hates sin. He just isn't going to tolerate it. He's going to judge the world. He's going to do it again, by the way, any day. Uh, but it says the ark rested in the mountains of Ararat. Mountains is plural. Now, this is important. There are those people who teach that Noah's ark is on Mount Ararat. I have read many books. This is an awesome book by Nathan Meyer. He's convinced it's on Mount Ararat. Ken Ham is convinced it's on Mount Ararat. Carl Baugh is convinced it's up there. John Morris and uh, Stephen Austin from ICR are convinced it's on Mount Ararat. And it might be, I don't know. But what I have read, and I think I've read everything that is uh, nearly everything published on this topic from, from these people who I respect, they will say, you know, we went up on Mount Ararat and we got struck by lightning and there were rock slides and landslides and there's pillow lava up there. Yes, yes, I agree, I agree. And then they'll say, you know, the, we just almost saw Noah's Ark. Well, how do you almost see something? <laughs> Okay. And there are stories about the Russians going in there in 1916 or 17, you know, photographing the ark, coming back with all the data, and then the revolution started. And it was all lost who knows where, you know, during the Bolshevik Revolution. So, I don't know. I'm willing to listen to both sides. But here's what happens. The people who believe it is on Mount Ararat have spent a lot of time raising money for these expeditions. And they get really bent out of shape if you even suggest it might be someplace else. And so some good creationist groups have ostracized me, or they won't recommend my ministry because I even mention that there's another option. I'll say, well, you know, maybe you might want to look someplace else. The Bible doesn't say it landed on Mount Ararat. You ought to try this. Get, get something floating in a bathtub and have something rise up under it. What's the chances of it landing on that rising object? It's going to float off to the side. It won't land on the rising object. It could, I suppose, but it's highly unlikely. Mount Ararat is made of a special kind of lava called pillow lava. Pillow lava occurs when a volcano erupts underwater. As soon as the lava comes out, it cools quickly. And so it looks like a pillow, for lack of a better word, and so they call it pillow lava. In Hawaii, I've been over there three times, uh, they, volcano, when it erupts, if, if it has time to cool down, it cracks you know, a different kind of lava as it, and then if it cools instantly. When the lava's flowing right into the ocean, big steam cloud, and it cracks up into sand, breaks it all up. Uh, the black sand beaches in California, I don't know if you remember that, Eric, you might have been too young, but we used to go just north of San Francisco, we would see the uh, black sand beaches that were obviously from a lava flow that flowed down and hit the water and cooled off and broke up quickly, made this uh, black sand. Mount Ararat is obviously a volcano that erupted underwater because of the type of lava it is made out of, called pillow lava. Um, and there are some folks who th are convinced it's up on Mount Ararat. I think it is possible that as a volcano is rising up, or as the mountains are lifting up, that the ark would get snagged on the side as it comes up, but I think it's unlikely. It is more likely that an ark would come to rest in what is called a nested area. If, a mountain, if the mountains are lifting up under the water, if there is a, a small pool that slowly drains off, you know, surrounded by a ring of mountains, that's called a nested area, it's more likely for, for a floating object to get caught there and settle out in a plain somewhere. Many people think this is Noah's Ark right here. This is a boat-shaped object. It is 17 miles away from Mount Ararat. Now, Ron Wyatt was a good friend of mine. He died about a year and a half ago. His uh, website, wyattmuseum.com, uh, has all sorts of data on this topic if you think, if you want to study this object right here as being a possibility for being Noah's Ark. Richard Reeves is a friend of mine. He took over for Ron Wyatt. He has been there many times. There's a picture of Richard with Mike and I out by the climbing wall. Um, Richard and his family have been down here several times, and Rick, they've got a museum up there just south of Nashville that is worth stopping and seeing if you want to see the museum, uh, Wyatt Museum. Um, the guys who think it's down in the valley, this is information about the, the ark down in the valley, okay, if that's it. They say it has collapsed in on itself and folded out to the side. Now, this term, Eric, you might want to learn, uh, when a boat it falls out to the side, it is splayed. S-P-L-A-Y. 
splay is a, a boat will, you know, if the boat isn't built just right, it'll just fold out to the side. You don't want that to happen while you're, uh, while you're swimming or floating around in it. But an old wooden boat, you know, pe when, I, when I people mention about Noah's Ark, I say, first of all, let me explain. It's been 4,400 years. I'm not sure anything is left of a wooden boat. Maybe nothing, maybe there is no ark. It's a, there's a possibility that for the, for the last 4,000 years, people have been going there breaking off pieces to take home for a souvenir, and it's gone. You know, like the Catholics, when they become a priest, they will get a piece of the original cross of Jesus. Well, somebody figured out there's enough pieces of the cross of Jesus to build about four cities now. <laughs> he was strong carrying that thing up the hill. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I don't know. The best two possibilities seem to be that it's on Mount Ararat or it's down in the valley. Now, there's a third group that says it's over in Iran. It's not even in, not even in Turkey. It's in a different country. There's, no, there's a series of mountains over there where they think it is. Now, Bob Cornuk has spent a lot of time searching over there. He thinks it's over in Turkey in this mountain range, only because of the verse that says they journeyed from the east to the plains of Shinar. And he says, if you're going to journey from the east to the plains of Shinar, you have to go from Iran to Baghdad, which is where the plains of Shinar are. Shinar are? Shinar were. Uh, they are still are. Anyway, he's assuming, I think, of course, by that, that when they built the Tower of Babel, they, they stood, stayed right where the ark was. By the time they get to where they journeyed over to build the Tower of Babel, this is 200 years later. I don't think they stayed right at the ark for 200 years. I mean, they could have walked over to Iran. It's not that far away. Okay? And then journey to the east. So I don't know. I don't know where the ark is. But Ron Wyatt's site is pretty convincing to me. They found iron rivets in that region. Of course, we know they had iron before the flood came. Tubalcane was an artificer in brass and iron, the Bible says. And it could be they, they actually bolted the ark together with the big rivets. Ron had several of them. I held them in my hand. Um, it looks like, just like you would do a rivet today, a large steel pin, maybe an inch diameter, where you put a big washer over it and then beat the head to round it out. And it squeezes the wood together and it can't come apart. This is typically how a rivet is done. When I worked at General Motors, I ran the rivet gun for a while, putting the frames of the trucks together. You drop this pin in, about as big as your thumb. It's already got a round head on one side. You drop it in the hole and you get this big machine that's held up by a little crane and you have a motor you can control it. It's like a big C-clamp. You put it over the rivet and it squeezes it down into a ball on both sides of the metal, like a pop rivet, only this is as big as your thumb. And for joke, some of the guys at General Motors would take just the rivet gun, put a rivet in it, and squeeze it, and it squeezes it into a perfect ball, or close to a perfect ball, but it's red hot. All that pressure produces heat. Then you toss it to somebody, here you go. <laughs> you know, that happened all the time at General Motors, I'm sorry about that. I didn't do it, of course. The other guys did it. Uh, but anyway, these rivets that are found up there are very convincing that they are indeed from Noah's Ark. And the skeptics will always set up a straw man and they'll say, you know, like the, the former preacher turned atheist. He said, Noah couldn't build a wooden boat that big and they didn't know how to work with iron back in those days. Yeah, in other words, I'm smart, everybody else is dumb. <laughs> that's what he's trying to say. And that's always what it boils down to. Uh, the government of Turkey studied the problem carefully and they own the property. And they are convinced that this is Noah's Ark down in the valley. Now, the guys who think it's up on the mountain are coming back and they're saying, well, the reason they said that is because they don't want people coming over here looking for it. So they just said this to keep people out of the country. That's their excuse. You need to be aware of that. Um, they, the Turkish government even built a visitor center there. Apparently, it's not a safe place to go now, though, because people are getting killed there because of all the Kurds that got driven out of uh, Iraq are now living up in that region. They're nomads, you know, have no place to live, refugees. Uh, X Creation X to Hilo magazine has published uh, several very nasty articles claiming this is not Noah's Ark done in the valley, and they give all their evidence. When this article came out in the Creation magazine, the first thing I did is I think what any Christian should do. They were in this magazine blasting Ron Wyatt, saying it's not Noah's Ark. I called Ron Wyatt. I said, Ron, let me read this article to you. I read the whole article. He was able to answer every objection. One of the things they show in this magazine, and I recommend Creation Magazine. You know that. I mean, we love it. It's a great magazine. I encourage you to get it. But they have blasted this uh, other site of Noah's Ark several times in their magazine. 
because they've spent a lot of money looking for it on Mount Ararat. <clears throat> so one of the pictures they show shows a satellite image of the region there, and it shows two more boat-shaped objects. And they said, see, that's not Noah's Ark. It's just a boat-shaped object because there's two more of them in the area, kind of like this, you know. And they're not too far from each other. So I called Ron. I said, Ron, what do you say about that? They're showing pictures in here of two more boat-shaped objects that look just like yours. Why do you think yours is Noah's Ark? He said, well, Brother Hoven, you taught science. Tell me, when mud flows around an object, if there's a mudslide coming down a hill and hits a big boulder, it's going to flow around it, right? I said, that's right. He said, one end is going to be pointed, the other end is going to be rounded. I said, right. He said, the pointed end is at the bottom. You can tell which way the mud flowed by the pointed end. Mud flowed that way, right. The rounded end is the same thing when an airplane wing. It's round on the front and pointed on the back. The air flows over it just right that way, okay? He said, you're right. There are several more of these objects in that region, but now go back and look at the one I say is Noah's Ark. It's backwards. The rounded end is downhill. That's a good answer. I think you at least ought to give the guy a chance to, to defend himself. <laughs> so that's what I did. And I was satisfied with all of his answers, and I recommend... If you're going to, get, going to get into the study of Noah's Ark, and you, I don't know which site it is. Maybe it's neither, all right? But I recommend you read all the books from both sides and really decide. I've decided I don't know, but I'm fairly convinced that it's probably down in the valley. I'm still willing to listen, and if that makes some other creation ministries blackball me because I make that statement, well, then grow up, okay? <laughs> yeah, I think if you're going to research, you ought to study all the possibilities, all right? Um, what they're doing, I think, they're doing the very same thing that the evolutionists do. We want the kids to see our view and don't let creation in the schools. And we got a bunch of creationists that are convinced it's on Mount Ararat. They don't want anybody to see any other evidence for the other side. And I think that's just childish, my personal opinion. Okay, Genesis chapter 6. The Bible says the ark is 300 cubits long. Now, Moses did not write Genesis. Moses was the editor of Genesis. There are ten different authors for Genesis. And it's divided up in the Bible when it says, these are the generations of, that's the break point. That's called a teledoth. They're signing off, and then somebody else takes over. And I've put together stuff, Eric, for the seminar part seven in the question answer. You know, where are the ten sections of Genesis? Some people say eleven. Apparently God wrote chapter one and the first few chapters of, first few verses of chapter two. And then Adam took over, and Adam actually wrote part of Genesis. If you look at Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, it's very fascinating. Every time, I think in Genesis 1, in the 31 verses, it refers to God 31 times. And it says, God, every time. When you get to chapter 2, it says, Lord God, every time. Interesting. There are very obvious changes in style at 10 different times in Genesis. Uh, Terry Pruitt, I've debated him three times now. He's a Genesis scholar, and he says there are four different authors to Genesis, and they were all just you know, do it, doing it for political purposes. It's a bunch of priests got together and tried to say Moses wrote this book. The Bible never claims Moses wrote Genesis. The Bible claims Moses wrote Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the first five books are called the Pentateuch, or the books of Moses. But that's because Moses edited Genesis. He took the clay tablets that were probably passed down. Probably Noah took the first few chapters on the, on the ark with him. Clay tablets that he got from Adam or, or Methuselah or somebody. Methuselah lived long enough, and he's probably the key character. He lived long enough to know Adam for a long time, and he knew Noah for a long time. He would have been a perfect overlapping person to know both, you know, and say, here's the tablets I got. These are the sacred records. Protect them. You know, all you got to do is scratch on a piece of clay and then let it bake in the sun, and it's permanent pottery, you know. And that's how a lot of stuff was preserved. Okay. <clears throat> The Bible says the ark is 300 cubits long. Since Moses was the editor of Genesis, he probably used the Egyptian cubit. If I was going to write a book and talk about something, I would probably not use ruples if I said, oh, this car cost, you know, 80 million ruples. Now, you folks, you know, that speak Russian, to you, that means something, a ruple, right? One ruple is worth, what, zero? <laughs> Very close, right? 
It used to be worth a lot of money, didn't it? Economies change all the time, you know. Our dollar today is equal to three cents of what it was just not even 100 years ago. 100 years ago, three cents would buy what a dollar buys today. One ounce of gold. An ounce of gold costs, oh, 300 400 dollars. Okay, the price varies all over the place. For 400 bucks, you can buy a nice tailor-made suit. You can go have a custom-made suit and a brand new pair of shoes for 400 bucks, right? One ounce of gold. 150 years ago, when the cowboys were settling the West, one ounce of gold was 20 bucks. And with that, you could buy a tailor-made suit and a new pair of shoes. See, the price of things has not gone up. The value of the dollar has gone down. That's all that's happened. It still takes an ounce of gold to do the same thing it did uh, 200 years ago. This is a stable. This is a stabilizing factor. And when our country went off of the gold standard, whew, that was the beginning of the end financially. Uh, I don't normally carry one with me. I just brought one. We're teaching on it tonight in class. Uh, the uh, 300 cubits, though, Moses probably used the Egyptian cubit because that was what he was raised with. A cubit is from your elbow to your fingertip. So that'll be a quiz question. What is a cubit? The way we get standards of measurements are interesting. Uh, an inch, for instance, was the width of somebody's thumb. A, uh, oh, hang on. Now, a foot, for instance, was the length of somebody's foot, you know, and a yard was from your fingertip to your nose for somebody. It's not mine. Mine's longer than that. Okay. They finally standardized things a little better than that. It's a little easier to have a standard measurement. But object down in the valley is 300 cubits long. If you use the Egyptian cubit, which is 20.6 inches. The standard Hebrew cubit is 18 inches. Mine is 21 inches. So this is, uh, that's what a cubit is. So if that's Noah's Ark, it certainly is the right size. That makes it about two-thirds as big as the Titanic. So it was a very large boat. Around the Ark, around this region down in the valley, they found, I believe, 12 so far of these rocks have been found. These rocks weigh 9,000 pounds, roughly. They are sort of a teardrop shape, almost like they've been shaped for a particular purpose. Um, they have a hole drilled through the top, and the hole is curved. I've drilled a lot of holes. I've built a lot of houses. I don't know how you drill a curved hole through a rock, but they did. Apparently, and by the way, the bigger the rock is, the bigger the hole is. The theory is that it's probably to hold a rope. Bigger rock, bigger rope, of course. And the rope was hanging this rock over the side of the boat down into the water. This is called a drogue stone. The purpose of a drogue stone is to keep the boat from shaking around when the waves go by. Shock absorbers. In the, today, in the Navy, they have uh, water, I don't, that's not the name for it, they call them drogue chutes, a parachute. If it really gets stormy and the boat's shaking around, you shoot these things down into the water with a chain on them or something, and the parachute, like an umbrella, opens up in the water, and when the boat tries to tip this way, the parachute helps to stop it, it slows it down. So by having a bunch of rocks all around the boat, the boat would be a nice smooth ride, even though the storm is you know, moving things around. The other advantage of this is, <clears throat> if it really gets windy, the rocks are going to drag behind you because the wind is going to push this boat and it will always turn it perpendicular to the waves. The danger of a boat in, the, in big waves is, if the boat is going this way and the wave hits it from the side, it'll roll the boat over. This is called capsize, to roll over. When uh, big military ships today get into a storm, they turn the boat and he head into the wind. Because the wind is going to make the waves go a certain direction. You want to be going straight into the wind so the waves can't hit you on the side and knock your boat over. Well, if you had drogue stones, the wind would turn you automatically at a right angle, perpendicular, to the waves. You can't capsize. One scoffer said, well, if he, if he had all those rocks hanging all over the boat, uh, wouldn't that slow him down? 
Uh, he wasn't trying to go anywhere. <laughs> Where was there to go? He's just trying to float, okay? I think if I was Noah, I'd make my ropes long enough to have those rocks touch the bottom. Float up, survive for seven months, float back down. Otherwise, you don't know where you are when you land. Not that it mattered. There's nobody to go visit, but uh, he probably uh, had these rocks long enough. One scoffer I debated said, you can't have a boat that big because when uh, they tried to build a, a boat with six masts, called a six-master. If you don't know a sailboat, has the pole sticking up out of it. That's called the mast that holds the sails. Most of the old ships had two or three of these masts. You know, you see these huge poles with all the sails on it. One company, back uh, 1850 or something, tried to build a huge wooden ship. It was 330 feet long, I believe. And it had six of these masts sticking up. The reason we have these big trees right around here in Pensacola, the Spanish planted a lot of these trees. They're called live oak because the wood doesn't rot. Uh, it eventually does, but it's very rot resistant. And it's extremely strong. They keep their leaves all year round. They slowly, you know, they're, ne they're always green. These live oaks are great for building the mast of a ship. Extremely strong, and they would, of course, trim off the branches as they grew and make them grow straight to get uh, a good straight log for the mast of the ship. Well, the scoffer said they built a ship that had six masts, and uh, they took it out in the ocean, and it was just so big when the waves came up, the wave would lift up the middle of the boat, and the ends are bending, and it kept bending and bending and bending, and pretty soon it started leaking everywhere. And he said, see, you can't build a boat that big. Well, Noah's Ark didn't have any masts, for one. It's not trying to sail. It's just built to float, right? Secondly, God gave him the blueprint. God told him how to build this boat. It was probably reinforced with iron. And the scoffers always assume, of course, there's no iron in this Noah's Ark. And if Noah's Ark had a moon pool, it would solve the problem. I don't know that it had one, but it certainly could have. A moon pool is a hole in the floor with walls built up inside. <clears throat> and when you go over the wave, the water goes up and down inside that hole. And it does the same thing that a piston does. As it goes up, it could push all the air out of the boat, or some of it, just like your lungs do. When the wave goes down, it would be a suction that would suck fresh air in. It would be air circulation. So, we'll have to leave it right there for this week. And next week, we'll talk about what happened to the dinosaurs after the flood. I mean, if this is true, that Noah took dinosaurs on the ark, what happened to them? We'll cover that in the next class. Thank you so much.